So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about aortic stenosis. And this is going to be a pretty uh, heavy technical talk. So uh, uh, pour a nice glass of coffee. Uh, it'll help you get through this. So he's a 59-year-old male who presents to his family doctor with recurrent chest pain and lightheadedness. Has a past medical, past medical history of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, goes to the hospital, gets several investigations done, and it's found out that he has aortic stenosis. So the first part of uh, uh, diagnosis uh, of aortic stenosis is morphological. So in this picture, uh, videos here, you have a short axis aortic valve on the left-hand side, and the right-hand side, you have a, a color comparator. It's neat to note here that actually the effect Keller Capera has on your, on your frame rate. It drops from 103 hertz all the way down to 29. So when you're doing the morphological examination of aortic stenosis, you're basically looking at four things. You're looking at the number of leaflets, the mobility of the leaflets, the thickness, and the calcification. Uh, one, the base of the two major uh, types of tricuspid aortic stenosis would be calcific and uh, rheumatic. So, how do you tell the difference between those two? Well, it's quite, e uh, whoops, sir. It's quite easy. Uh, rheumatic uh, disease is typically uh, involving the commissures and you end up having a tri uh, triangular orifice. While the calcific disease, you have calcification at the basis and in the central parts. And, and uh, consequently, you get more of a stellate uh, orifice. The other thing that's a little hint if you have rheumatic versus calcific disease is that with rheumatic disease, you typically have uh, mitral valve uh, involvement. Another concept you read about a lot of times is aortic sclerosis. And I actually really didn't know what that entirely meant, but the definition of aortic sclerosis is a calcified thickened valve with normal leaflet motion and typically at velocities uh, less than 2.5 meters per second. So continuing on to this exam, uh, and back to that previous image. So what does this valve look like? Is it rheumatic? Is it calcific? Uh, well, from my appearance, it looks like it has three leaflets. They're not moving very well. And it kind of, it's hard to appreciate here. It looks more like a, a stellate-like appearance. So this is a calcific disease. And if we went and lo looked a little bit further, there's no uh, good common in mitral valve disease. So continuing on with the investigations, uh, this is a short axis, I mean, long axis aortic valve, again, with color comparer. And what you see is a heavily calcified valve and some, again, you'll see some shadowing uh, distal to the aortic valve or uh, deeper than the aortic valve. And then there's a little bit of AI, probably mild AI. And I'm not gonna go into that because we had three talks on AI already today. Continuing on, uh, on the left-hand side, it's uh, LV. It's thickened, it's contracting nicely, probably a grade one LV. We did diastology in this, we probably have at least impaired diastolic dysfunction. And on the right hand side, there's a double envelope continuity equation performed. And we come up with a pretty significant uh, aortic stenosis around 0.46 centimeters squared. So for the next uh, part of this talk, I'm gonna talk more about uh, grading the severity of aortic stenosis. So you morphologically, it looks like AS, but now, how severe is the AS? So the guidelines break, uh, have a, there's a nice table in the 2017 guidelines breaking down how to grade AS. Uh, there are, in the tables, divided in yellow part section and green section and a blue section. And we're gonna focus on the yellow section and that's our recommendations for Doppler for all patients with AS. I'm gonna talk about one of the reasonable ones later on in the talk, so keep that in mind. So again, there's, and you can look at assess A, S, and jet velocity, mean gradients, and the continuity equation uh, by area. So let's start with the first, A, S, jet velocity. So what is the, what is the best jet velocity you obtain? Well, according to the guidelines, it's the highest velocity signal obtained from any window. Again, this is typically gonna be uh, obtained in your deep transgastric view. The main components of this is you basically want to optimize your window. You want to make it as large as possible, increase your y-axis, uh, use grayscale. One uh, thing people make a mistake about many times is picking up these fine linear lines at the apex of the curve or the peak of the curve. You want to eliminate those, uh, uh, those uh, fine linear signals. You need to make sure your Doppler is parallel to the intercept angle. 
And that's basically based on the Doppler equation with your cosine theta. If you are under 15 degrees, you're probably okay. Uh, it's probably going to result in an error less than 5% or an underestimate of your uh, peak velocity uh, through the aortic valve. If you have a situation where you have uh, an irregular rhythm, such as atrial fibrillation, which is pretty common in, with patients with uh, chronic aortic stenosis, then you want to look at several cycles, and the guidelines recommend five. But again, you're going to still pick your highest peak velocity from any of these windows. Continuing on, uh, like we talked about velocities, you can also look at mean gradients. So again, uh, gradients are calculated from the velocity information, but peak gradient is not really, is not uh, obtained similar, in the same manner as mean gradients. So peak velocity is basically equivalent to the peak gradients, 4b squared uh, per the Bernoulli's equation. Mean velocity, you can, uh, mean gradient, you cannot calculate from the mean velocity that you obtain from uh, from the if, uh, from the mean velocity, what you the echo machine actually does is averages the an instantaneous gradients across the ejection uh, period, uh, and again applies the simplified Bernoulli's equation. You need to keep in mind uh, that the Bernoulli's uh, the simplified Bernoulli's equation uh, is not valid if your velocities through the aortic valve are less than three meters per second, or more particular in our populations when the velocities are are uh, greater than 1.5 meters per second through the LVOT. And again, it's as uh, if, if, for example, if you have a velocity of two through the LVOT, two times two squared times four is 16. So that's gonna have a huge effect on your uh, uh, pressure gradient. So if that's the case, then you probably can't use gradients. Uh, like I guess it's a case where you'd have a high LVOT gradient would be a patient with sub or stenosis. So you have a, if you have a patient with sub stenosis with a high gradient or a high velocity through the LVOT, then you can't use your mean gradients. And at that point there, the best option would be to do telemetry of the valve. So continue on with mean gradients. This, uh, this, these two images confused me for a long time, but reality is echo overestimates the gradients uh, with cath, and it does this by two ways. Uh, with traditional cath, uh, one would calculate the peak-to-peak -peak gradient. And how, they, how does the cardiologist do that? They put a catheter into the LV, they measure a gradient, pull that through uh, the aortic valve into the aura, measure that uh, gradient and subtract. And that will give you a peak-to-peak -peak gradient. Uh, initially with the technology, they would do that at different time, uh, uh, time frames because you can't measure both at the same time. Uh, new and more advanced catheters, they can actually measure at the same time, because it has two offices, one in the LV and one in the aorta. And actually, after talking to Dr. Austin a bit about this, he says that the peak-to-peak -peak, uh, gradient, when it's measured at the same time at both locations, actually very similar to your mean gradients. Uh, looking at pressure recovery, again, uh, again, a complicated issue, but uh, what happens is when you have uh, blood volume going through the LVOT, you have a high potential energy and low kinetic energy or low velocities. As you go through the aortic valve, your velocities increase and your potential energy decreases. And as you exit, the opposite occurs. However, as you exit, you lose some of the energy uh, uh, via heat. And this is more pronounced in patients with, uh, and this is uh, the heat loss is more pronounced in turbulent flow, which occurs in patients with large aortas. So the net, uh, so basically, in a patient with a small aorta, there's less laminar flow, there's more pressure recovery, and that the net result is that echo overestimates gradients. Uh, again, there's like uh, all my references; those references are actually pretty good at reviewing uh, these concepts in further detail. Continuing on to the last component of assessing the severity of AS is the continuity equation. We're all pretty familiar about this, but Basically, you calculate the stroke volume in the LVOT. If you get the peak uh, AV VTI, you can solve for AVA. And there's several assumptions uh, when you use the Connie equation. And I'm going to go through some of the assumptions that make this more challenging. So the first question uh, is, what assumption in the Connie equation results in the greatest error? So again, I, I'm probably giving away this answer in the test at the end. but 
the cross-sectional area of the LVT is the most challenging uh, uh, measurement uh, for the continuity equation. Uh, this is a study looking comparing 2D versus 3D versus uh, 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 with diameters and also doing direct uh, measurements uh, of the 3D area using polymetry. And what you can see here is small changes in your radius has a, a quite a big effect on your aortic valve area. Uh, in this, uh, in the top one, you have uh, classical severe AS, and with a modification of that, you can put it into more of the moderate range. So it actually is uh, fairly similar at that point. The reason why the uh, the LVT is very sensitive, it's uh, fairly obvious, but you square the radius. So that is one of the major uh, uh, sensitivities uh, with the LVOT measurement. The other sensitivity is the assumption that the LVOT is uh, a cylinder. And as you can see in the uh, diagram C, the, uh, the LVOT has a minor and a major axis. The minor axis is an AP axis, while the uh, major axis is uh, uh, medial lateral. So it's more of an elliptical shape rather than a cylinder. And if you apply the assumption that uh, pi r square, which is a circle, this is going to lead to uh, uh, some error. So they actually recommend now, if you can obtain it, is to uh, do uh, to do a 3D polymetry of the uh, LVOT area to try to minimize that error and to improve re reproducibility between observers. Moving on, uh, I think this actually was brought up earlier in the talk is where's the correct place to, to place the sample volume of the LVOT. What the guidelines recommend is that you uh, put the, uh, your, uh, your pulse wave Doppler at the aortic valve orifice and slowly uh, pull it backwards towards the LVOT. And then you pick the, uh, the curve with the minimal broadening and a closing click of the valve. If you're too close to the AV valve, you're gonna have an overestimate of the Peak velocity, and again, if you're too far away, you're going to have uh, uh, underestimate. It's also a, a little bit challenging. You want to do uh, place your sample volume at the exact same level where you measured your LVOT area. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. You want to try to keep that as close as possible. Uh, moving on, uh, uh, other limitations of the continuity equation. You can failure to obtain your peak velocity. We again, we already talked that cosine theta will really uh, under change. I abrupt uh, large angles from parallel will cause underestimate of your velocities, but then you throw it into, uh, the, into the equation, then you're squaring it, so the error becomes more pronounced. Uh, differential flows. So in reality, for aortic stenosis, the major problem would be paramembrous ESDs. Thankfully, that's not very common. But what happens here is that uh, you measure your VTI and the uh, or your stroke volume and your LVOT, and some of the uh, stroke volume uh, leads through the paramembranous membrane, the VSD, and the other one, uh, the rest of it uh, travels through the aortic valve. And because you lose some of that mass, you get an overestimate of the AVA. Another common problem with the Connie equation is you measure the wrong Doppler signal. Uh, when you're in the deep transgastric view, you have flow from the mitral. If you have regurgitation, you'll have flow directed towards the uh, the echo probe and then you have your AS jet and they can be uh, they can be mistaken. The best way to do that is to look at diastology and systology and use your isovolemic contraction time your, and your isovolemic relaxation time to your advantage to help distinguish between the two jets. So you plug in and measure the most appropriate uh, uh, envelope. Uh, Two more of uh, limitations would be a low cardiac output state. And what happens here is you have a non anatomically non-stenotic valve, but because of low flow, the valve can't open fully. And so that leads to uh, and uh, affects your uh, effective orifice area that you calculate through the conduit equation. And last but not least is uh, uh, prosthetic uh, valves uh, can cause underestimate, underestimate of the EAO, or EAO. And you should uh, basically reference uh, your results with the manufacturer normal values. So we'll continue on with the, uh, the presentation. So this is post-op. And what you see here in a post-op image is, is a barbacetic valve. Uh, what you're looking for is rocking. You wanna make sure the valve is well seated. You want to look for transvalvular and paravalvular leaks. 
And again, this all looks uh, uh, very normal. Looking at log axis, again, uh, you know, uh, you're seeing the same thing. So there's no leaks and there's no, uh, and everything appears to be uh, open and closing well. And to finish off the investigations uh, post-op, uh, you want to do a gradient through the uh, valve. Actually, my, these, my presentation, I, was, I can't see the side of it, but I think the mean gradient is four, but I, I'm going by memory here, but it, it's shown, so I apologize. But again, it's a, a normal gradient across the uh, bottom prosthetic valve. So we're going to move on to case number two. Uh, it's, I can't feel my face when I'm with you, but I love it by the weekend. And it's basically a 30 year old male who presents to the emergency department with symptoms of left facial numbness and slurred speech. Uh, similar to the last gentleman, a past medical history of diabetes, hypertension, and this uh, gentleman has palpitations. Again, goes to the hospital, TGH, gets a million tests, and he's found to have aortic stenosis, poor LV function, and atrial fibrillation. Uh, this is his first uh, pre op image of his LV. So it's, uh, it's a pretty pretty poor LV function. We graded at a grade three LV, some LVH and some dilatation, or probably significant dilatation. Going into the long axis of the auric valve, uh, this kind of looks kind of weird. It's very heavily calcified. Uh, it appears to be stenotic and there's a high jet velocity exiting the auric valve. So this is suspicious. Uh, could this be bicuspid valve? We'll continue on. So now we're at the looking at the uh, aortic valve and short axis. And this is a very, uh, again, a very tight valve. And uh, again, uh, does anybody know what kind of valve this is? Again, it's a little hard with the interaction here, but this would be what Amaran talked about earlier in his presentation. This is a unicuspid valve, extremely rare. About 5% of the patients that come into the OR would have that if they have AS, but in the population, it's closer to 0.02%. And it can, again, it can have one comma sure, it could be a comma sure. And again, these uh, people with a unicuspid valve typically present early in life with uh, aortic stenosis and it's also associated with uh, dilatation of the aorta. Then going on to the right-hand side, we see some pressure gradients. Uh, we see a peak gradient of 40. And uh, if you trace that curve out, uh, you get a mean gradient of 20. So, hmm, so we have a, a bad LV we have something that appears stenotic, but we want have a mean gradient of 20. So that doesn't fit uh, the idea that this patient has severe AS. So this is when you have to go back to the guidelines. Probably, a, uh, this is probably more advanced than we need to get into uh, because we're perioperative echocardiographers. We usually see our patients in the OR and hopefully uh, this has been determined before we come into the OR. And matter of fact, uh, uh, we, uh, in order to do the final steps of this, uh, of this algorithm or this uh, approach, you need to do a dopamine echo, which again, we would not do in the operating room. So basically to, to, to summarize this uh, grading of AS, there's basically two columns. I'm gonna move through it quickly. You have a typical high gradient AS with a, a peak or mean gradient greater than 40 a peak velocity greater than four. And the only thing you need to exclude is whether uh, whether this is a high flow uh, status. Examples of that would be anemia, hyperthyroidism. And what they recommend the guidelines is fix it and then reassess. If it's, uh, uh, and then if going on to the left-hand side, you this is your low gradient AS uh, with a gradient less than 40 or mean gradient less than 40, which is what we were, I was showing in the previous slide. You look at the ABA by the continuity equation, calculate or polymetry, cal calculate that area. And then you keep on following your way down the algorithm. If you get to a point where you have a low EF, which is around step six, then you do a dobutamine study. And if uh, the dobutamine study causes your valve area to increase over one, you have pseudo. If it stays under one, you will have true severe aortic stenosis. This is the only aspect of the assessment of aortic stenosis that doesn't use echo. I kind of alluded before. Uh, haven't mentioned it before, but the definite the assessment of aortic stenosis is now an entirely echo-based assessment rather than other modalities. The only exception would be the calcium score uh, by CT, which is help, which is used in an integrated table to help delineate uh, uh, some classifications of ADS. I'm going to skip this slide, but it's basically summarizing 
what I just did before uh, using uh, the dobutamine uh, stress test. And the last part of the talk is how many gradients or velocity measurements needed to be made, uh, need to be averaged with atrial fibrillation. The guidelines recommend five uh, averaging of the, uh, of the velocities or gradients. One, uh, uh, because you get beat to beat variation. So your loading conditions are gonna change beat to beat to beat. So uh, that's gonna have a profound effect on your, on your continuity equation. One other way to, uh, to get around that would be to do a double envelope, which I'm shown in the middle here. If you do a double envelope, you're actually capturing your, uh, your velocities uh, at the same time, at the same beat. Uh, so that would uh, eliminate some of your beat to beat uh, variability. And you can actually just directly apply that into a velocity ratio. Uh, I think that Azad spoke about that earlier. And if you have a, or I think Azad did, or maybe not, but if you have a velocity ratio less than 0.25, that'd be indicative of severe AS. And just to finish off the images, uh, this is post-op. So the gentleman went underwent a barbitonic valve. Again, similar to what I talked about before, uh, good function, all leaflets are working. Uh, on these images, there's no leak. There's a lot of acoustic shadowing beneath the valve. And uh, this is our deep transcastric view. There is a little leak. This is probably a normal jet uh, with the mechanical valve. And we get a nice mean gradient of four. So again, another success, uh, successful story or successful valve replacement. And uh, that ends my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention.